Good evening. We're on the air once again with another edition of Patience on the News. And uh, I have to say, my favorite interviewee, because he knows how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll interview you, Harold. <laughs> yeah, all right. Senator Angus King, he's a pro at this. He's a pro at many things. I think he's actually a, a, a pro at being a United States senator, because I've been in and around uh, politics uh, my whole adult life. I spent many, many years in Washington. I was a congressional liaison for the Peace Corps when it first started, spending many of my days on Capitol Hill. So I observed the House and the Senate, and there's some people that look like senators, behave like senators, think like senators, and Angus King is one of them. So I'm very pleased that, uh, so. that uh, you could be here, Angus. Well, you know, we like to be topical sure. uh, here, and a lot's going on, and we're going to get into some of the gridlock in Congress, and I know that you read and you read history and you might be able to put some of this uh, gridlock in context. It's not the first time in American history and much like, uh, frankly, what, what led up to the Civil War in the uh, 1850s and the way members of Congress were at each other's throats practically. Well, I'm gonna, I want to talk about that. You want to get into that yeah, now? Let's or get you into do... that now. Let's get well, into it now. Well, the first yeah. thing is we don't hate each other. I mean, every, people think that. You, get, you know, you read about the toxic Congress. It's very partisan institutionally, you know, Mitch McConnell and, and Chuck Schumer yeah. and, and that. But personally, I mean, if the best evidence of this is to watch a Senate vote where the senators come in and sort of wander around and they vote, they walk by, it takes 15 or 20 minutes, or actually it usually takes longer. Harold, if, if St. Peter comes to you and says, you have 10 minutes to live, you should say, could it please be during a 10-minute Senate vote, because you have at least an hour. But anyway, what you'll see if you watch C-SPAN 2 is a lot of chit-chatting on the floor. It looks like the dump on Saturday morning. And it's almost always bipartisan. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, Dick Durbin talking to John Thune or somebody else, uh, John, John Barrasso talking to Ossoff of Georgia. I mean, it's... And so the idea that we that we're at each other's throats that it's it's bitter. And I don't personal. think this is. I don't think that it's a, so much the senators. That's the most exclusive. I think in the, I that's think, the most exclusive club in America. Well, I, I think the House it may be more more personal. I think but, so. But uh, and the other piece is that conflict sells newspapers or cable TV shows, and. The truth is, we've, the, the last Congress was one of the most productive in the last 10 or 20 years. There were seven major bills passed. Five of them were bipartisan. Two of them were Democrats only, but five of them were strongly bipartisan. The PACT Act, the infrastructure bill, a, a lot of these major bills that, 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 you know, that people don't think that we can do anything together. And the answer is we can. But some issues are still really hard. I immigration, for example, it's hard to get agreement on that. There's so much politics in Why the Why is it hard on immigration? Well... You mean you had your senator from Florida, what's his name? Uh, uh, Rubio? Rubio. Ru Rubio was all about let's have reform of the system and let's fix it. Well, we got very close. In fact, in, in 13, the first year I was there, we passed a major comprehensive immigration reform in the Senate with 67 votes. It went to the House, and John Boehner, the Speaker at the time, wouldn't bring it up. If he'd have brought it up, it would have passed, and we'd be way beyond a lot of the fights that we're having now. So that was a, that was a real missed opportunity. To me, and I'm talking with some of my colleagues quietly about it, Republican and Democratic colleagues, there's an obvious deal. And the deal is border security and... Uh, something to, to give the dreamers a pathway to citizenship, and workforce. Harold, the biggest issue after inflation in Maine and everywhere else right now is workforce. Every group that comes to my office from Maine, whether it, I've had the loggers, the, the medical association, the nurses association, teachers, principals, school superintendents, there are shortages of people everywhere, and it's the major thing that's holding our economy back right now. So one of the possible fixes is immigration, because 
this country's been built, was built on legal immigration. And so that's, I, I think there's an opportunity. The question is whether the majority in the House wants a solution or the issue. You, you see what I mean? I do see what you mean. Do they want to get, do they really want to fix it? What makes you or think do, they want a solution? Well, that's the question. Or do they just want an issue that they can hammer the Democrats over the of head with? Of course they don't want a solution. I say, you can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, of course, the Republicans in the House do not want a solution to the problem. They want to use it as a sledgehammer. But anyway, that's, it, I, you know, it's one that just mystifies me. And why don't they want a solution in the House? Those Republicans, because their voters, their constituents are, you know, they're part of what's always been the case. Human beings are afraid of strangers. They're suspicious it's, of strangers. It's historically true. You go back to the 1840s, there was a whole political party called the Know Nothings, and their whole platform was no Catholics and no foreigners. Exactly. Uh -huh. and, thing, and human nature is unchanged. In 1924, my my father came in 1914, along with grand, my grandparents. In 1924, 10 years later, all immigration of Greeks was essentially shut down, the quota system, yeah. based on the number of Greeks that had come to this country in 1850. Well, the, 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 country, the, the country was pretty much totally open until the, like the 1880s, and the first immigration law had an interesting title, the Chinese Exclusion Law. Yeah. So th this is part of our history. On the yeah. other hand, immigrants are also who we are. I mean, I, I speak to large groups and I say, okay, how many of you here are uh, either an immigrant or a descendant of immigrant? And of course, everybody says, and then their hands go up. I mean, yeah. that's who we all are. And we've, we've got to fix this because we're, we're, uh, uh, we're aging. And if we don't have new people coming in, and, and, and it, they can, they, uh, you know, they don't, they don't have to be from foreign countries. They can be from Ohio. I mean, we can bring in people into Maine from wherever, but, but immigration is part of our history. Here's one of the problems, Harold, and I haven't seen anybody writing about this. This is an observation I've made. We now have these heavily gerrymandered, uh, congressional districts. They're either all Democrat or all Republican. And our states have become heavily red or heavily blue. Maine is, they say, purple. It's, you know, we can vote for people of either party. But here's the problem. In, in many states and congressional districts today, the primary is the election. In other words, if, you, if you're in Oklahoma and you win the Republican primary, you're going to be the senator. The Democrat has no chance. That's just the way that state is set up, or, or Alabama. And if you're in a district in Brooklyn, if you're the Dem you get a Democratic thing, you're going you're to win. So here's what's happening. You can lose that primary, not because of your position on immigration or abortion or gun control, but because you're viewed as a person who's willing to listen to the other side and try to solve the problem. You can lose, in other words, if you're seen as someone who's willing to compromise. <clears throat> if you think about that, that's really dangerous because our system is, ba you can't solve tough problems without compromise. But do you see what I mean? What's the worst thing you can call a Republican today? A rhino, Republican in name only. What that really means is a Republican who's willing to talk to Democrats and try to solve the problem. And, th and think for themselves. Yeah. But, but, it, but I think this is one of the most dangerous things because it, 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 it goes a long way toward explaining the, 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 uh, the, par the paralyzed nature of our politics. I've had good friends in the Senate who we work together for three or four years and then it comes time for their reelection and they stop talking. They're, they're almost afraid to be seen with somebody from the other side. And, um, that's, that's just not, that, that, a democracy, a, a, you know, a, a democratic republic can't function that way if the people are afraid to talk to people who have differing views and try to find solutions. The voters demand it. Their voters demand it. Their voters want them to behave that way. And that's how they get ahead in politics, behaving well, that one, way. Well, one problem is that primaries tend, the voters in primaries tend to be the activists mm -hmm. on either side. 
100 percent of the Democrats or 100 percent of the Republicans don't turn out for a, for a primary election. Um, here in Maine, for example, let's take a, just a typical example. You can have, uh, take a Republican primary. There are about 30 percent of the people in Maine are Republicans, okay? So you start with 30 percent of the people in Maine. In a typical primary, Democrat or Republican, about 20 percent will show up. So 20 percent of 30 percent is 6 percent. The person that wins that primary wins with 35 percent, three or four candidates running. 30 percent of 6 percent, 2 percent. 2 percent of the people of Maine are selecting the, 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 the party candidates right. for U.S. Senate or governor or whatever. And the, the pressure is toward, if you're a Democrat, toward the left and, or toward the right if you're a Republican. And that's why we have these, you know, people with their more so extreme divided, views. more extreme, and afraid to compromise. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's it's not an easy place to work. It is not an easy place to work. You know, I was the Democratic chairman at one time, and I was totally against uh, open primaries. Totally against. I said, no, these primaries are to build party loyalty. That's totally wrong. Totally mm -hmm. wrong. Open primaries are very important. You got to be a You've got to force politicians to worry about other views, not just the mainstream party view. Right. And uh, so there are things that can be done, but I don't, it, you know, it's all about power. Well, and, people talk about the Congress being polarized, but the country's polarized. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the Congress reflects the, the population to a large extent. And uh, that goes, we can spend a lot of time, that goes, in my view, to the fact that we've got, we're living in different factual universes. In my experience in public policy, going back to being governor and, and even before, if you can get everyone around the table and have a common understanding of the facts, it's fairly easy to get to a solution. The solution is usually sort of self-evident. But if the people around the table have totally different views of the facts, it's practically impossible to get to a solution. Do you think of of immigration as MS-13 and gang, gangs and rapists? Or do you think of immigration as, as uh, Harold's family coming over here in, in uh, 1914 and building a, a successful career in the United States? If you have these radically different views of, of what, what the facts are, it's very hard to solve problems. And we, people are getting their news from places they, they agree with. And we have politicians, leaders, political leaders, who stoke that anger, who actually oh, yeah. live off of it, stoking it. And so if you well, don't... Well, then the problem is what happens when, they, when it gets beyond them and they can't, can't stop it. Donald Trump was booed in Alabama when he talked about being vaccinated. Yes. By his people. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it gets out of hand. Of course, I think he likes to get out of hand. Let's do, let, <laughs> He, 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 it's a source of his power and influence. But Donald Trump, it seems to me, is, uh, owns the Republican Party. Now, uh, I, I, do, I do think so. They're afraid of him. Mm -hmm. They know that if they anger, if they say anything bad about D D Trump, his voters, who he owns, are going to turn on these Well, the truest thing he ever said was back in 2016 when he said he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't cost him any votes. Absolutely. He knows that. And it is true. And look what's happening now. I mean, there... His polls are going to go up because of this indictment. His polls will go up because of the indictment. Um, you know, I, I don't understand this, uh, why this is a party of, uh, of law and order, supposedly. It was in my day. The Law and Order Party. Mm -hmm. Now it's let let's Trump. In, let's investigate the DA. Yeah, let's investigate the DA. It's totally changed. Let's let's eliminate the FBI. Let's do all of these crazy things. Nobody's going to do any of those things, but they talk about it. And um, Bill Clinton was about to be indicted when he was president, mm -hmm. finishing his presidency. Uh, the special counsel had told people he was going to seek an indictment, and so. Clinton made a deal. He admitted he lied. He made a public statement. He said, you know, I admit I lied. He was fined. He was disbarred. Humiliating thing for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was disbarred. Uh, but he made the deal in order not to be indicted. 
This guy says, I don't want to make any deal not to be indicted. This helps me. Sure. Of the public, so many people in the public will admire me for being, like John Gotti was admired by many people. The murderer, John Gotti. People like that. They like celebrity fighters. Fight, 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 fighters and criminals. Well, John part, Gotti. Of the, part, of the, part of the issue these days is the, the so-called weaponization of the government. Um, and I'm not sure how that's really defined. Um, and and it, 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 it should work both ways. I mean, if, if the House Judiciary Committee investigating the DA in, in New York, that's a kind of weaponization of the, <laughs> of the, of the Congress. But, but it's a, uh, you know, it, it is where we are. And it's, 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 it, it's, the problem is that we're devaluing our institutions. Our, we don't, people don't, I don't think we realize how much we take for granted, how much we assume uh, trust. For example, elections. You go to the town office on election night and the t town clerk says, that, you know, 800 for, for uh, Patius and 750 for Bellevo, and you say, that's the, okay, that's the vote. But you trust it, you, you, you see what I mean? And, and, and if that trust is eroded, which is what really worries me, then it, it all breaks down. And, and um, you know, I didn't agree with much that Donald Trump did, but I thought the worst thing was the undermining of confidence in the election process itself. But you have nearly half your colleagues that don't agree with you, that don't worry about it, apparently. You know, maybe you, maybe you see something, you talk to them personally, maybe they do, privately worry about it. Do they? Um, <laughs> I don't want to talk about what my colleagues say privately, okay. but I would say that there's uh, uh, more skeptic skepticism of Donald Trump privately than publicly. Yeah, publicly. Because they're responsive to their voters. Of course. It's a disaster for them politically if they were to be very critical of him. Uh, it is amazing that this guy who's a con artist, uh, you know, is a sale snake oil salesman, is probably, in my lifetime, by far the most powerful Republican ever. And he wasn't, ever, he wasn't even a Republican before he decided this is the route. Well, I'm, take. I'm not a psychologist. I mean, he obviously tapped into something that I, uh, I think he's, uh, he tapped into a frustration in the, in the, in the society of, of change, change uh, fast change, uh, uh, changes in the world, and he he just he he channeled it, uh, and I don't think it was so much. Is a good, you could have a long discussion about whether he was doing this consciously or whether it was just him. I think a lot of it was just him. Oh, instinct. I mean, he, his instinct, going back you know long before politics, uh, and I think he just uh, he he hit a uh, a current that that's there that's probably always been there. Uh, but he's he's enabled it and and uh, has that that kind of uh, that kind of power. I don't think he has majority support in the country uh, no. by any means. Thankfully, um, so you know the question will be who who the Democrat who runs against him and I, I think it's pretty sh certainly he'll get the Republican nomination. You I know, do Mayor too. Curley was elected mayor of Boston while in jail. Right. So I don't think the indictment will affect his. Ability to get the Republican nomination, but then you know, then Joe Brent, Joe uh, uh, Biden will it looks like is going to run, but we don't know. That's it's almost two years away. Yeah, no, I agree that Trump is shoo in for the Republican nomination uh, because his opponents are afraid to disagree with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're trying to do this dance of <laughs> having some level of disagreement, but still, yeah, I mean, poor Ron DeSantis is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Let's talk a little bit about uh, prescription drugs. Uh, the Senate and the House passed this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and it, tell us what it did with respect to prescription drugs. Well, for the first time, it allowed Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies for lower drug prices. Basically, it's a volume discount. and. The funny thing about this is that the VA and Medicaid, which is uh, health care for lower income people, have had this power 
forever, for, 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 you know, I don't know how long, but 30, 40, 50 years, it's been assumed. The reason Medicare, which buys, as you can imagine, drugs by the gazillions, because it represents so many million seniors, the reason they can't is that when the Medicare drug benefit was passed under George W. Bush, I think it was 2005, the Congress put a specific provision in that new benefit saying Medicare can't negotiate drug prices, period. So that's been the, that, if that's the president, you can take it. But, uh, but that's been the law for, you know, 20 years, 15 years. Finally, this past, uh, this past year, we, uh, we, we changed it. And uh, by the way, it, it's sort of a lesson about how politics works. I think it was the very first bill I introduced when I came into the Senate with Jay Rockefeller in 2013 was for Medicare negotiation of drug prices. And it, you know, and I'm not taking credit for it. A lot of other people worked on it over the years, but it finally happened 10 years later. The stars align. You know how the Congress works. You never can tell. You work on something for years and years, nothing happens. Then all of a sudden, it's, things come into place. So basically, it allows <coughs> Medicare to, to negotiate a volume discount on the drugs that they buy. And, and it will lower prices for the government. It'll save the government, the Medicare program, billions of dollars and ultimately drive down prices for uh, everybody else. So here's what, here, here, here's what I think I understand, but I want everybody to think about this. So uh, none of us know people, particularly older people like me, who don't want lower prescription drug prices. And uh, so back when this, uh, this Medicare Drug Act passed, and they sh they, they made sure that you could not negotiate right. a lower price. Probably weren't too many Americans that said, "I'm for that. I don't want to have." Right. The, the, Heaven so, forbid we should have lower drug prices. Heaven forbid. Yeah. So um, it pleased only one group of people: drug manufacturers. So it had to be their lobbyists were pleased, but the public wasn't pleased. Right. So the lobbies have some influence. Well, we have a, we have a system, uh, Harold, that, that uh, there's too much money in politics. There's too much money, and uh, it comes from all over the place. I have an idea for uh, election finance reform uh, that's totally unconstitutional, so I'm going to think I'm going to try to put it in the form of a constitutional amendment. I want to get your reaction. The rule would be no one can contribute to your election campaign except people, people who are eligible to vote for you. In other words, if you're running for the U.S. Senate in Maine, only Maine people can contribute in a limited amount of three or four thousand dollars, whatever it is. But then, no, no outside money, no, uh, uh, you know, billionaires from Arizona coming into the main Senate race. I mean, the amount of money that's in these, in these races today, Susan Collins and, and uh, Sarah Gideon, it was like $130 million. I mean, you and I remember campaigns where it was a million or two was huge, huge money. Bill Hathaway's campaign in 1972 was $212,000, and it was the most expensive Senate campaign in Maine history. Uh, but the, to me, the idea, we ought to get back to the idea that the, you, your supporters, your finances, should come from the people you're representing, and 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 it would utterly change the the, the landscape because right now there's just it's just so much. Out well, you're right. It'd have to be a constitutional amendment. Oh yeah. When George Mitchell that. first got to the Senate, he called me up and he said, "I want to put together a committee to study campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. and I want you to chair it." So we did, we got all these people on the committee, and we came up with some very good suggestions, but of course we ran up against one thing, free speech. Free speech, yeah, and the Supreme Court has defined money as speech. Money as speech, yep. Yeah, so and that's why it has to be a constitutional amendment. It has to be a constitutional amendment. Um, back when, By the way, I threw this idea out with some of my colleagues at dinner the other night. <laughs> they all loved it. Yeah. I don't know if they'll vote for it, but the idea of not having to spend so much time make, making fundraising phone calls and, 
and drug going all over the country. Every, every Mitch McConnell won't be for that. No, though. I don't think Mitch will like it. No, he will not be for that. Yeah. So, same thing with the Inflation Reduction Act. It passed. You can uh, negotiate lower prices for drugs. It will help us all. But then immediately, a bunch of Republican senators got together and put in a bill to reverse that. Which I don't understand. I don't well, understand what the possible argument is. They are, they, 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 and they won't tell you, I'm sure, what their argument is, except that it's clear. It's the lobbyists wanted them to do it. Well, one, one of my problems with, with drug prices is that we're paying the highest in the world for the same drugs. Yeah. And I, I remember I was a, approached, and this was when I was governor, I was, I can't remember where I was, but a, a <coughs> lobbyist or a representative of one of the pharmaceutical companies said, why do you, why don't you like us, you know, why aren't, you know, and I said, I feel like the only guy on the airplane paying full fare. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and, and so you can get the same drug in Canada, the same drug, uh, for half of right. what, it, what it costs here. And they always say, uh, well, we need the money for research. Yeah, that's their argument. My problem with that is that they spend more money on those TV ads we see than Every they do night on research. Every night on the news. And we're one of only, I think, two or three countries in the world that allows those ads. Yeah. Uh, I have fun. When I watch one of those ads, I write down the name of the drug, and then I go online and find out what it costs. And usually it's like, you know, $10,000 a pill or something. Right. I mean, it, yeah. And um, again, why are we advertising to you and me when it's only doctors that these are prescription drugs? But do you know the, the, the answer to your question? I suppose it's because people will go to their doctor and say, I want this new thing that I saw on TV. Yeah, but the other answer is that there is no good reason why we have to pay the highest drug prices, double other countries. There is no reason except the lobbyists have the influence on Congress, and the public doesn't put yeah. fire to the feet of the uh, politicians. The public, can, this you know, it's self-government. We can have an influence. The public well, can have an I, influence. I haven't seen any polling, but I suspect that the, the negotiation for drug and the Inflation Reduction Act probably has an 80% approval rating. Yes, uh, but, but when those Republican senators put that bill in, there was no pushback. They didn't take any risk. Well, the other thing that I can't understand, frankly, uh, and I don't want to sound too partisan on this, but the urge to take health insurance away from people, I don't get. I mean, to me, uh, there's, there's a not trivial statistical relationship between health insurance and living longer. Um, and what is the well, reason? Well, well you, you and I remember the passage of Medicare, and it was a big deal at the time. Socialized medicine, remember? It was socialized medicine and, and the end of the country and Barry Goldwater and, and everything. And yet it's, it's, a, it's a godsend. I, mean, it, it's I, I was lives. there. I was there at the signing. I worked for oh, Johnson. Oh, you worked for Linda Johnson. I, right. was there, I, I was there in Independence, Missouri, when, at Harry Truman's library when Johnson signed the bill. No question about it. Socialized medicine is going to bring the country down. Right. Finish right. the country. Right. And then, you know, okay, so flash forward 50 years and we're having the same fight about the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. Which is nothing more than helping people but buy But I don't insurance. understand how the people get convinced that these guys who are against uh, health, 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 expanding health insurance, I don't understand how they get away with it. Well, one of the interesting things is if you look at a map, you'll see that the highest percentage of people who are getting the Affordable Care Act are often in the red states. But how, so, so how, how do they get away from being against it? They're politicians. I don't understand why. It can only please a group of people who don't want to expand but it. But see, you're, you're, you're assuming that people vote and make decisions on policy and Often it's different than that. It's it's deeply mysterious and emotional, and it's how you feel about somebody. You know the famous thing about George W. Bush. You know, is it somebody you want to have a beer with? Yeah. Uh, and th so those kinds of things are very much a part of this. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've run a bunch, of, run in a bunch of elections, and if you know, the, well, when I went to college, the, the major was was we called it government. 
because I remember, that I'll never forget, the head of the department said, that we have a government department because there's no science in politics. There's no such thing as political science. Uh, but uh, it's, like I say, it's, it's mysterious. That's a good point. I think that guy made a good point. There's <laughs> yeah. no science in it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's emotion. Yeah, and, 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 and that may not be entirely bad. I don't think we should say, because <clears> if people are making decisions on, on their sort of a gut instinct of, of, of what they see for character and honesty, and, and uh, you know, that's not a bad thing. I mean, it, you, we don't want our representatives to be just mechanical of, you know, the the poll says this, yeah. so therefore they're going to do that. You know, why do we need the representative then? Right, you can do it with a switch. Right. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, Edmund Burke's letter to the electors of Bristol about am I am I just a representative or am I supposed to use my best judgment and and knowledge on your behalf? And Muskie used to say, I remember, I can't remember what the issue was, but somebody said, well, that that's not polling very well or something. And yeah. Muskie said. The polls can change from day to day. I'm supposed to do what I think is right, and I've, that's, that's and not only I've that, to do. But if you're in the United States Senate, you kn know all of the nuances. You know all of the. You have all of that information that I don't have right. ordinarily. I mean, I read a lot, but the fact is, you have more information. Yeah, and that's and, valuable. And, that, and that's my job. And that's your job. Yeah, and and, and uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's it. There's a balance. I mean, yeah. there's a balance. You don't you don't want to be arrogant and say I know best. And I don't have to listen to my constituents. I, you absolutely have to listen to your constituents. My, you know, I like coming back here and <laughs> believe me, I, they tell me what they think. Yeah. In the airport or in Millinocket or Skowhegan, where I was a week ago, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so you you absolutely have to listen. But I think your constituents also expect you to, as you say weigh the, the information that you have and, and, uh, and, and do what you think is best for Maine and for the country. You alluded to something earlier in this uh, program about facts and truth mm -hmm. and how everything can crumble in this country very, very quickly if we pay no attention to facts. We don't care about what's true. Yeah. It's very, very dangerous. Well, here's one of the problems. There's a, there's a phenomenon called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is the human tendency to seek out sources of information that you already agree with. You, you, you read the columnist first that you like, and you don't read the one that you disagree with. Yeah, and I do that. Everybody does that. And, and so what we have, I mean, the best example is Fox News and MSNBC. If you're a conservative, you watch Fox News, and you get a steady diet of conservative information. If you're, if you're a liberal, you watch MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, and, and, and uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, and, and you get, you're, getting, you're getting your own biases confirmed. Obama once said if he watched Fox News for a week, he'd hate himself. <laughs> uh, but the problem is that that is, and then you compound that with the internet and the algorithm on the internet where if you click on a story, a negative story about Hillary Clinton, one, for the next month, you're gonna get a steady diet of you'll never guess what Hillary did next. Now, I do, it happens to me on uh, online when I go shopping for a product, you know, Wayfair has decided I like, I need a wall sconce. I must have looked at wall sconces, so, but, you know, I'm getting all this stuff. Here's the thing, Harold. I don't mind it when they use the algorithms to sell me things. I don't like it when they use them to sell me ideas. And that's what's going time. on. I get it all the time because I do read, because I do this program and I'm kind of a curious guy. And so I'm always, I watch Fox News, yeah. not steadily, but I watch it. I want to know what they're saying. And uh, I even look at the New York Post all the time. I want to see sure. what they're saying. But that means you're, you, get, you see how this algorithm thing works. Oh, I get the, and I get the feedback. I get emails all the time. Uh, isn't but that's one of the things that divided us, divides yeah. us. When you and I were kids, everybody in America got their facts from one guy. Who? Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, sure. And now <clears throat> you, you, the facts are coming from all over, and they're coming from sources. They're tending to push us apart. But here, there's another step, and you didn't ask me what, uh, what keeps me up at night these days. 
artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. The power of this new technology is unbelievable. I would urge your viewers to go to chat, B, uh, chat uh, GBT, the word chat, chat GBT, GBT 4. And you go in there. Number four. Number four. Chat. GBT4. GBT4. And it says try it out, and you can try it out, and you write a sentence. I could put in, I could write in, in fact, I did it over the weekend. I said, write me a poem about the Penobscot River in the style of Robert W. Service. And within 15 seconds, a 20 stanza poem came out that would have taken you or I a month to write. I mean, it was unbelievable. About the Penobscot River and the falls mm -hmm. and the beauty and the trees and all in the style of Robert W. I mean, the power of this is unbelievable. The dark side of it is that it can be used to create false um, films called a deep fake where a professor uh, I saw in eight minutes put in about 30 seconds of his voice, a picture of himself, and then had it write a narrative about how he kicked dogs or something. And it created a film of him moving his eyes, his mouth moved, his own voice, saying stuff he never said. I mean, it's it, terrifying. It's terrifying. And yesterday in the New York Times, there's a big, long interview with the inventor with the guy who started the company. Who's very worried about it. Very, very worried. He said it's like developing the atomic bomb. Yeah. Something useful could come of it, but it could be a disaster for the human race. That's right. Just what he said. That's, I, and, and, and I believe it. I've been playing with it over the weekend, and it's, it's uh, shocking. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, it's fun to you know, write a poem or an essay. Uh, but where it goes, and I'm, I'm in, I, I, sent a, I sent a copy to my, two of my friends down in, in the Senate and said, this is something we got to talk about. And nobody knows, you know, and, and we're in a free country, we don't want to censor things right. and those kinds of things, but uh, this is an incredibly powerful technology. And again, democracy is based on information. But what if the information is made up? What if it's not information? And in, in the old days, you could, uh, here I sound like in the old days, but in the old days, if a, somebody put a negative TV ad up about you, yeah. you could put on your own ad, ad rebutting it. Or if it was really gross, you could ask the TV station to take it down if it was just a lie. But if a, one of these fake videos goes up, how do you, it goes online, you, you can't catch up with it. You don't know who's seen it, where it's gone. Uh, so, so this is, uh, this is a new frontier that, that is something that we've really got to think I about. I should about. say to the audience, uh, when I was talking the other day to Senator King's communications director, uh, he said, uh, oh, I had to, I, I'm sorry, I, did, I, I didn't call you right back. I had to take a call from Senator King. He is really worried about artificial intelligence. And here I am. And He's here you are talking about it. So if, while we're on facts, you're a member of probably the most, most interesting committee in the Senate, the Senate Intelligence Committee. Yeah. You know a lot, and you'd have to kill me if you told me. That's right. So, well, it's funny because I get interviewed and I have to consciously think, where did I learn this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did right. I learn it from reading it in the newspaper, or did I learn it in a classified hearing? Right. So, um, but one of the things about facts that the, what we hear a lot is the word hoax. Trump uses the word hoax, and his followers do too, all the time. This right. is a hoax, so that's a hoax. So your bipartisan committee uh, did a, uh, a review and an investigation of Russian meddling in the 2016 right. election. And Trump said, and I think it's a narrative that kind of took with the public, Trump said, it's a hoax. There was yeah, no... The Russia hoax. The Russia hoax. Yeah. The Russia hoax. Now, look, you're... 
you were a member of the t Senate Intelligence Committee that wrote this, a Republican-led committee right. that wrote this report. Is it a hoax that they interfered in the 2016 election? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, it, it's, it's uh, a couple things about our committee. It's, it's, it's one of the more nonpartisan committees in the, in the Congress. In fact, if you watch one of our hearings, we, we very, most of our hearings are, in, are classified, but we have open hearings periodically. If you watch a hearing, you couldn't tell who was which party, because yeah. that's just the nature of our committee. And yet it's, it's ideologically diverse. I mean, we have John Cornyn and Tom Cotton and Dianne Feinstein and Ron Wyden. It's not like it's a whole, you know, middle people. Right. It's, it's pretty diverse. But uh, during the Russia investigation, the committee was led by Richard Burr, a Republican, staunch Republican from North Carolina, who came in. He came in as part of the Newt Gingrich revolution in, in, the, in the House. Um, but yeah, the simplest answer to that is that on August 2nd, 2016, Paul Manafort, who was then Donald Trump's campaign manager, had dinner in New York with a guy named Konstantin Klimnik, who was an agent of Russian intelligence, and gave him Trump's internal polling data. The campaign manager gave a Russian intelligence agent the internal polling data. Now, you know enough Detailing about... Detailing polling data. You know about po polling data for a candidate it tells you where you're vulnerable, where you're not, who's supporting you, which states you're strong in, where, where the battleground states are. And what are the issues that will move the needle? That's right. And, I mean, that's the simplest answer to me. That, that's, and, and there's no doubt about that. that and happened. the Republicans on your committee agreed with that. Yes. The, the, our, our report was pretty much unanimous uh, all the way down the line. And the, I have it on my desk. The, the report for the the, the final part of the study was whether there was a connection between the Trump campaign and, the, and, and Russia, and the, the volume is this thick. I mean, it was a, a, a deeply um, uh, researched, we, 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 at, we went to the CIA building in Langley, Virginia, and looked at, at cables, I mean, live intelligence about what was going on during that period. And there's no question that the, First, there's no question that the Russians were trying to interfere in the campaign. I mean, they've been doing things like this for a long time, but this was really systematic. And then the question was whether there was there, whether there were connections to the to the uh, to the Trump campaign, and there were. I mean, the one I just outlined. Yeah. Um, so uh, the word hoax just doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. So um, there is impending a major crisis in the Congress, the debt ceiling crisis. Yeah. And so you're going to have to be in the middle of that, uh, dealing with it. And uh, the way I look at it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> whether or not to approve a, an increase in the debt ceiling is not about spending whether we should spend more, it's, it's whether we should pay our debts. That's. I'm so I'm glad that's where you started because there's a lot of confusion. The debt ceiling sounds like something that you can't. Yeah. To increase spending. You, you want to increase spending to hit yeah, it. Yeah. In reality, it's 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 allowing the government to pay the bills that it's already incurred. It's as if you. It's it's exactly like going out to dinner ten times in a month on your credit card, and then deciding not to pay the credit card bill. That's. That's what it is, it's, it's, and that's really an important point. And um, it's an archaic law. It goes back to World War I. Nobody really knows why we have it. Um, it doesn't, it, it's... But, but, it, it, but if it doesn't get increased, what happens? Well, we, we're in default. We can't pay our bills. And if we can't pay our bills, the economic the, the disaster. Could be worldwide because the dollar is the unit of value around the world. Mm -hmm. The dollar would decline. Uh, it would, the immediate effect on American taxpayers is that it would significantly increase the price of borrowing, okay. which would result in us having to pay more to borrow money. Now, is there a debt problem? Absolutely. Should we be working on it in some kind of thoughtful way? Yes. But this isn't, this, uh, uh, blunt instrument is not the way to do it. And the, of course, the problem is it was increased three times during the Trump years when Republicans controlled the Congress without much of a peep. 
all of a sudden it's it's World well, it's War III. only when there's a Democratic president. We understand that. It does seem so that these way. Republicans. The debt really matters except when it doesn't. Yeah. So many of the key supporters for the speaker, when he was having trouble getting elected speaker, made this a point. You gotta be with us on this. We we do not want to approve uh, right. a, a, an increase. We're in gonna the, use the debt ceiling as a weapon. Use the debt ceiling as a weapon. Either we bring down the country and the, our economy in America, or do what we say. The problem is, I don't understand what, what to do what we well, say is. They don't say what they want. Well, if it's varied. But the, the, what worries me, Harold, is that some of these people, well, I, I divide the Congress now into legislators and performers. And some of these people, I think, wouldn't care if we brought the country down, wouldn't care if we brought the economy down. They, they, I don't think they've, they, you know, I don't think they, they're too worried about that, or they think that'll prove their point, or, or something like that. Tim Kaine, uh, my friend from Virginia, had a, he, he said, look, we can negotiate about budgets. You know, spending budgets, that's what we do. But not, a, not, not the debt ceiling. I mean, we've got a budget coming up. Right. I don't know if we're going to be able to get a budget or not, whether there'll be any agreement whatsoever on a budget. But, but the debt ceiling is, a, uh, is an artificial rule. It may be unconstitutional. There's an interesting question, because the 14th Amendment says the public debt of the United States shall never be questioned. And there's an argument that that makes the debt ceiling, which is a statute, it's not, a, it's not in the Constitution anywhere. It's just a statute that was passed in, like, 1921. Um, I don't know the date, but anyway. So that constitutional provision, I don't think it's ever been tested. No. If I were the if I were the president now, I would have somebody bring an action and see whether whether it's a constitutional yeah, provision. But the problem goes deeper than that because those people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and irre totally I'll say it you're in politics totally irresponsible, dangerous people who have a lot of influence with the Speaker of the House. A lot of influence. Um, yeah, he's going to have a hard time making the deal. He, although, although remember, the, the margin in the House is only five votes. Right. So uh, you, could you, have, need, you could have a dozen Republicans vote with the Democrats and, right. and, and, and do it in, yes. a, in a more uh, rational and, and responsible way. But what's interesting is they say we want to reduce spending. And they absolutely refused to say how. They talk about two things, foreign aid. Let's get rid of foreign that's aid. That's 1% of the budget. Yeah, that's 1% of the budget. Foreign aid, get rid of foreign aid. And uh, let's not be sending money to support the Ukrainian resistance to the Russian invasion. Yeah. That's what they want, folks. Those are the two things. What else? Have you heard, you hear these Republicans talk about anything else? Well, it's interesting. There was a poll the other day that said, how many people, who, who, should we reduce the debt? And the answer was, you know, 85% yes. And then they started asking, <clears throat> giving options. And it was 85% no on all the options. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's hard. And they've already taken off the table Social Security, Medicare, which is good, and defense. And so that leaves only domestic spending, and that's not enough to, to fill the gap. Uh, they've... You know, and, and then you start saying, okay, well, does that mean the VA? No, no, we don't want to cut the VA. How about, uh, you know, health, health insurance for seniors? Well, no, that's, you are going to do, we're going so to do that. So isn't that a reason why we need at least a few statesmen in Washington? Statesmen. People You who know what a statesman is, a dead politician. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Muskie's a statesman. Yeah. No, you know. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Yeah, well, I'm saying, but, you know, when I, I read about Madison and all the negotiations about they, they had to go through to come up with a constitution that people would vote for and get adopted yep. by, by the states. And uh, these people were 
They, well, Madison's a good example. He was educated they were brilliant. moral philosophy. Yeah, well, you read the Federalist Papers, and there are all these references to Roman history and early British history yeah, and, and Greek history. Yeah, and, yeah. and they, they uh, the other thing, though, I've, I've thought in, for years, they were geniuses when it came to understanding human nature. They, they understood, there's a wonderful, I think it's the 51st Federalist where Madison says if, and, and you have to excuse it, it was gender only at the time, but he said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Absolutely And true. if angels were to govern men, no checks and balances would be necessary. But in a government of men over men, there must be constraints. And that's what our whole Constitution is. Angus, I'm 87 years old. I, you don't look a day over 86. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't, uh, I, 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 there are a lot of things I haven't learned. But I think, and that's why I like reading about Madison and the other founders, mm -hmm. they were keyed into human nature and they understood it. just what you said. I'm glad you gave us those quotes because uh, it was all about human nature. We would not need, but for human nature, we would not need governments. And the one thing that is not... By the way, they hated political parties. Yes. The Federalist Papers and Washington's Farewell factions, Address factions. are all about factions, and, and they could have been written yesterday. Ex could have been written yesterday because while things have changed dramatically in human existence, just think of medical science, how that's it. Watch watch the NBA in basketball and see the difference between how they've evolved now to what basketball was 50 years ago. Yeah. It's all, we've all, everything's evolved, but not human nature. And it's all about fear and makes us do well, irrational But it's things. also about the human tendency toward the concentration of power. The old saying from Lord Acton, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what they understood. I give a, 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 a talk about the Constitution, and I take with me a Vegematic. Remember Vegematics? Yes, I do remember. And I, I carry, I have a thing, and I have a cucumber, and I said, okay, this is George III. Here's all the power right here in one person. The Constitution, you put the cucumber in the Vegematic and push it thing, and it comes out in about 20 pieces. It, it is a Vegematic of power. It divides it between the House, the Senate, the President, the courts, uh, vetoes, two-thirds, treaties, all, you know, all of these elaborate steps to make it hard for the majority to run roughshod over the minority because the not, and, and that, that, you know, very limited powers and limited powers in federalism, the states have a role, it's, and, and that's, that is based upon their understanding that you have to be careful with, with people getting too much power in our, in our society. And I think, I think they'd be pretty worried about the presidency. The presidency has evolved into a, a much stronger, you, they used to call it the central magistrate. And the presidencies, you know, the old term was the imperial presidency. For example, we just took a big step last week. We repealed the, the authorization for the Iraq war because Congress, <coughs> ought to be responsible for whether this country goes to war, not the president. That they, the Constitution is very clear on that. Congress shall have the power to declare war. You know when the last time Congress declared war? 1942. Yep. And why? Not because the president grabbed the power, but Congress gave it up. So we took a big step last week. Tim Kaine led it, uh, bipartisan, to repeal the authorization for for Iraq, to, so no future administration can use that as an excuse for sending troops anywhere and everywhere. I'm glad you said that because uh, I think people need to understand that that the division of power, the separation of powers, is critical to the functioning of this country. And even though it's clumsy and slow and difficult, yeah, and I they wanted it to be that way. <laughs> I worked for a president who was imbued with a lot of power, and like power, and wanted the presidency to have much more power uh, sure. than he then had. And interesting about him, Lyndon Johnson, his, of course, Achilles' heel was the Vietnam War. Right. He couldn't find a way out. He couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And the people that brought Lyndon Johnson down were senators from his own party who criticized him, who had hearings, 
uh, Fulbright Church, right. others who finally said this isn't this is. They brought him working. down, and the people who ultimately brought Richard Nixon down were senators from his own party. Correct. So. That's I have the, a I have a question for you. Yeah. If Richard Nixon had had Fox News, do you think he would have resigned? No. I don't think so either. No. If he had Fox News, he he, he wouldn't have resigned. But I want to. Bill Barr. I always. I think Bill Barr is a very intelligent man. Oh, yeah, I met general. with him, and and he is very intelligent. I didn't vote for him, but yeah. but he's a smart guy. He's a very smart guy, and he believes that the presidency should have more power. He believes in imperial power. George Washington, eight years as the first president, one of the great things he did was to make sure he was not an imperial figure. Well, he was offered the, to be the king, to be the, you know, and he, he, he turned it down. Yeah. I think it was George III that said if he leaves after eight years, he'll be the greatest man in history. He walked away uh, and established a precedent. Yeah. Uh, and... No, it's 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 a real concern. You in a modern complex society, you need be, to be able to do things, but every time you give away the power, to, more power to the executive, uh, that's you know that's that's a that's a real concern. Uh, this this I think you'll find this interesting. I'm reading Meacham's new book about Lincoln. Yes. During the Civil War. Lincoln almost lost the election of 1864. Everybody thought he was going to lose. He thought he was going to lose. Uh, Sherman taking Atlanta probably is the only reason he, he won. But the troops were all for him. But in those days, there was no such thing as absentee voting. <clears throat> and so some states that were pro-Lincoln passed absentee voting laws to allow the soldiers to vote absentee. Other states didn't. And those states didn't want Lincoln to win. Do you see what I mean? The idea of states manipulating the electorate is not new. I'm I was sorry. fascinated. You have to come back again so we can talk about electoral reform and elections. We could spend a whole hour, you and I, on just, just that and states' rights. And the Civil War, which you just talked about, is the best example of states' rights. We want to do it this way. We States' rights say we can treat people this way. Well, we have to wrap it up because, but believe we, it or not, we're just not, getting started. We're just getting started. <laughs> exactly. We could do this uh, uh, for a long time. To and come. our readers would go to sleep. <laughs> our viewers, right. rather. That's right. Thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, as always, I, I enjoy it because it's unique to have a politician sit here with no scripted questions, no scripted answers, and have a discussion. I thank you for that. Thanks, Harold. Pleasure to be with you always.